Good morning, this is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture. Going to be another hot weekend in Portland, Oregon. I've seen a topic come up in many, many gardening groups the last several weeks, and I think it is something that as we see summer waning and we're thinking about saving seeds, we're thinking about putting things that have gone over into our compost, it, it warrants a conversation. And that is about the group of plants we call melons, squash, and cucumbers. I think that there is some incorrect information that keeps getting shared and if we understand a little bit more about the taxonomy of these plants and how they reproduce, um, we can kind of correct that misinformation and feel more confident as gardeners. So I've said in the past, permaculture is really about good scientific understanding and in order to have good design we have to understand our plants well. That includes observing their habits and also understanding the biology of the plant. So there is a large family, in fact a huge percentage of edible uh, crops that we grow come from this family and that is the cucurbitaceae. It's a big family. If we think of like the nightshade family, which includes tomatoes and potatoes and eggplants, that's also a really big, you know, culinary family. So this is similarly very diverse. And melons, summer squash, winter squash, and cucumbers are all in this big family. But that doesn't mean that they're all particularly super closely related, okay? In fact, um, many of the cultivated varieties originate on different continents. So I wanted to talk about those quickly. It's a lot of information to get into in one video. We're looking at here my chicken coop, my asparagus patch, and there is Concord grape growing through it. And then I don't know if you can see here my mint, which I let go to flower because it's such great August bee food. And then vining all throughout it is this really long rambly plant. And that is a winter squash that I'm growing. It's actually just two plants, very big and rambly. So let's start with that one. There are three distinct genus in the cucurbitaceae that we get food from. There are lots of other varieties that are, uh, lots of other genus that are not edible to people, but the, let's start with the squash. That's the genus cucurbita. And the one in front of us is cucurbita maxima. This includes the pumpkins the kaboka squash, of which this is a variety, Hubbard's banana, and one of my very favorite keepers, which I've grown in the front yard, sweet meat. I, I grow a specific variety called Oregon sweet meat. Fantastic. Such a good keeper. It'll keep for months and months and months and the flesh is delicious. So cucurbita maxima are known for these big, long rambling vines. And like all of the cucurbita genus, they have this really distinctive yellow flower. There are male and female flowers. Let's go in and look here real quick. So they have this very distinctive yellow flower. The female flower has a little bulge of an ovary at the bottom of the flower and the male flower has a straight stem. They are bee pollinated. I'm not sure if you can see there's a honeybee way down in here. So they're bee pollinated and by many different species of bees in the wild, and they originate in Africa. So also in this same genus, we have Cucurbita pepo, which includes the summer squash like zucchinis and some winter squash like acorn squash, squash, which I think is a dramatically overrated squash. It's stringy and watery and my least favorite. Um, there are two other species, one of which is, is a Cucurbita Argosperma, and that is the Kushaw squash. It is the only member of that genus that is consumed, and it's not really that commonly grown by North American gardeners. The other one is Cucurbita muscata, and that is one that is pretty, um, pretty commonly grown in North American gardens because it is the butternut squash. It also includes the Long Island cheese. So again, in this genus, we have summer squash, which are best picked small and young and tender. And then we have winter squash, which you don't harvest until the vines die. And they can sometimes keep for eight months under the right conditions. 
Okay, so moving on. We have, I'm actually not growing any this year. This is the first year in 15 years I haven't grown any cucumbers, partially because I didn't expect um, to be in the middle of a global crisis and I expected to be traveling quite a lot this year. And so I chose to reduce the number of seeds that I purchased and started for my garden. And one of the um, things I anticipated was traveling a lot in August and September. And so I didn't grow cucumbers because those are ripening here. But cucumbers are um, the genus Cucumis, Cucumis sativus. So we're looking at an entirely different genus. So cucumbers and the squash are no more closely related to each other than tomatoes are to eggplants. Also in the cucumis genus is cucumis mellow, and those are the melons, with one exception. There are subspecies within those, cantalopsis, um, inodorus, reticulatus, and those are the cantaloupes, the honeydews, the canary melons, and the musk melons. All of those are within the same genus but and same species, but different subspecies. And lastly, there is um, Citralis linatus, which is the watermelon, which originates from Africa. I'm gonna walk down here into another part of the garden where you can see some of my winter squash a little better. I've been pruning, so there's lots of hazel everywhere. So when we look at these different species, I see in gardening groups, folks post about mutt pumpkins, about, well, that's what I like to call them. I see folks post when they get volunteers out of their compost pile or volunteers in the middle of their garden and they wanna know what is it and is it edible. And I've seen a number of folks commenting, those are a hybrid between cucumbers and your squash or a hybrid between a melon and a zucchini. And those are dangerous to eat. So I wanted to clarify, this is, this is the topic I, I'm really, um, I think it's important to understand what we're dealing with here. So first of all, none of those separate species can successfully cross pollinate and create viable seeds. I just noticed that one of my, I don't know if you can see here up through this gummy berry, my pump, one of my pumpkins, that one back there is a sweet meat has sent out a big, huge tendril with yellow flowers way up in just the last couple days. Anyway, so none of these species can produce viable offspring by cross-pollination, just like your tomatillo and your red bell pepper may get pollen transfer from one flower to the other, but they are not going to produce viable seeds. They are not going to set fruit that you can plant and get a hybrid tomatillo pepper something monster i don't know the same thing if you grow your winter squash next to your cucumbers you don't need to worry you're not going to get those two plants hybridizing now what you might get is two different varieties of winter squash cross-pollinating and then that's how you get a mutt pumpkin but it is not two different species it is not a melon and a cucumber. You're not gonna get a watermelon cucumber hybrid. Not possible. So what is it that these volunteer squash are? So let's say that I have my, my pumpkin here. And let's just say that it happened to cross pollinate with a, um, a different variety. Whatever I grow off that, next year might not look like either of the parents. In fact, it probably won't. And it might not have all of the excellent qualities of both of the parents. In my experience, mutt pumpkins tend to be stringy and watery and not nearly as good as the carefully selected varieties that we, we buy in the store. A lot of times I see folks with high, not, mutt summer squash and they let them over mature and think that that is a winter squash. And then it's very unpleasant to eat because when winter squash should be picked at maturity and summer squash should be picked very small. So in general, I find that these plants are better for livestock food. When you get that volunteer, I find they're not as palatable and the texture is not very good. 
There's one thing you should look out for, which is that particularly if you live in a place with wild cucurbits that have the potential to cross pollinate with the culinary varieties, the wild varieties are much more bitter and they can pass that to their offspring. So what you get is a plant with a high concentration of cucurbitacin, which is the compound that exists in nature in much higher quantities than in the cultivated varieties. And cucurbitacin is bitter. It is there to deter herbivores from eating the plant. It can make you very sick to your stomach if you eat a lot of it. So basically my rule of thumb is if you have a mutt pumpkin, you wanna eat it. If it tastes bitter, particularly unpleasantly so, don't eat it. If it doesn't taste bitter, it's gonna be fine to eat and it doesn't contain those high levels of cucurbitacin. So now cucurbitacin has medicinal uses. Um, anything when you have enough of a dose of it can make you sick, right? So we've talked before about how the difference between edibility and um, toxicity is often in dose. The same thing for medicinal quality versus toxicity. So while something may be toxic, it also, th those bitter compounds may have medicinal uses. So I don't wanna make it sound like cucurbitacin is, um, you know, doesn't have beneficial properties because it does. It's been investigated for anti-cancer properties and anti-parasitic properties. And um, traditionally, some of those parts have been used medicinally by various cultures. But if you eat a whole winter squash that tastes bitter, you're probably going to get sick to your stomach. So I hope that clarifies for folks. Um, what we're looking at here, if you have a volunteer pumpkin or a volunteer summer squash, you are not looking at some kind of mutant or hybrid between a cucumber and a winter squash or a melon and a summer squash. What you're looking at is two different varieties from the same species have reproduced and created something that contains properties of both parents, may revert somewhat to a wild type, is unpredictable in its characteristics. You may get something great I mean, that's the beauty of open pollinated food. Sometimes you get a new variety and it's amazing. Um, but in general, volunteer squash I found are, are less awesome. So you may wanna think if you, if you wanna save your seeds, you need to hand pollinate and then tape or rubber band or bag your um, squash to make sure that only the pollen from the variety you want cross pollinates. And that's how you can get them to come true to type. But in general, don't worry, folks, if you grow your winter squash next to your summer squash, next to your cucumbers, next to your melons, it's going to be totally fine. All right, happy gardening. I'm going to get out of the sun before I get sunburned. Be safe. Thank you for watching.